All right, FAQ number 16. We have a question here. Who was Romans chapter 10 written to? We're going to start reading here, Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, and then we'll discuss who it was written to. It says here, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. For Moses, Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Okay? Now, there's this teaching that is being circulated by a hyper-dispensationalist, namely uh, Martin Richling, the heretic that he is. The guy denies that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, he believes that he is infallible when he speaks, and he believes that you have to die in a state of grace to be saved. Okay, he's a Catholic. That's all he is. I've done videos against him. And uh, this teaching is that the first eight verses there are Paul writing to Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. And that this is not for us today as Christians. Now, the reason that they do that is because then you go into verses 9 and 10, and I guess he would say that that's not for us either. So Martin Richling tries to get rid of the prayer of salvation. Okay, now, I did a whole study on that, the thing of is the prayer of salvation biblical and, and all that. You can look up that study. But the fact of the matter is it's just common sense and logic that if salvation is something that God gives, it's a gift to man, then you ask for it. You know, just calling upon the name of the Lord. I mean, pray to God, ask Him to be saved. You know, we've been over the thing of salvation. You can watch the salvation message. Okay, so the prayer of salvation is not wrong. Now, a prayer that people are being told to repeat and there's no repentance involved, there's no understanding of what they're really praying, yeah, that is wrong. I'm against that. But when you have somebody coming and they, they know that they're a sinner and they understand that that sin has separated them between them and, and God, they've sinned against God, and they know that they need to be saved, pray a prayer, you know, whatever. But see, this whole movement that Martin Richling is involved in, this hyper-dispensationalism, um, what they do is they will go through the Bible, and it's like there's this extreme pride in the system, and they will continually fight each other and try to be the best teacher out there, which is exactly what Martin Richling does. Guys like this, you know, you, you go in, in fact, to Martin Richling's website and um, you can't even get in to his members only area. Like, okay, <laughs> sure, yeah, that's scriptural. Um, just to really give you a real quick little synopsis of what dispensational teaching is. Uh, a dispensationalist is somebody in dispensational, or dispensation is a Bible word. It means that God dispenses something. He gives something, okay? God dispenses different laws and different uh, things to different groups of people. I'll give you a good example. In the Old Testament, were they doing things differently than we do them today in the New Testament? Yes, there was a system of, you know, God's dealing with one nation, the nation of Israel. They have animal sacrifices. We don't do those things anymore. Now God deals with both Jews and Gentiles. We don't have to sacrifice animals to, to pay for our sins and things like this. Okay, and of course those the payment that was made back in the Old Testament never took away those sins. So things are obviously different. Obviously, there's two different dispensations, at least two different dis dispensations, Old Testament, New Testament. Things are different. Okay, you can't just say the whole Bible relates to me. No, it doesn't. All right? Somebody that says that is usually willingly ignorant. They're not that ignorant, that stupid that they would make a statement. They're actually, they, they pride themselves in being non-dispensational. Guys like Mike Hoggard, uh, he does that. But I believe, personally, that there are more than just two dispensations. I believe that there are seven. God does things in sevens. I believe that the Garden of Eden was the first one. Obviously, there was a different setup there. You know, there, they had eternal life, essentially, and they had it until they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then they fell. Now, that doesn't apply to us today. Okay, we're not supposed to be walking around without any clothes on in a perfect garden. All right, the Garden of Eden, that time has gone. Okay, that was a different dispensation. So that's the first one. Then you have the time after the Garden of Eden up until the giving of the law 
to Moses. That's the second dispensation. Much of what happened back then still applies to us today. Okay? Then under the law, you have the Levitical priesthood set up. You have a system of animal sacrifice. You have a temple that the Jews are, are doing these things in, and you have special outfits for the priests and all that. You know, so things are different. And then when Jesus Christ comes in the New Testament, the law and the prophets are until John, and, you know, and then the, the, the kingdom of heaven is preached at that point in time because the king, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, has showed up on the earth. So there's the fourth dispensation, the time between the Old Testament and Jesus dying on the cross. When the kingdom is presented to the Jews, that's the fourth dispensation. The fifth dispensa dispensation begins with the death of Jesus Christ. As I've said, the number five oftentimes refers to the death of Jesus Christ. So number five, all those who put their faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are saved. Okay, That's the fifth dispensation where we are currently at. The church age, we would call that. The sixth one, what's the number 666? The time of Jacob's trouble, the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. That sixth dispensation. The seventh, the 7,000th year of, of rest, is the millennial kingdom. Okay, So there are seven biblical dispensations. And some people try to fight over more than that or, or less than that or whatever. But I believe in seven. Okay, I believe that that's the number that lines up with the Bible. And I believe that that's the way it works. The hyper-dispensationalists come in and they try to split the fifth one. They try to say, well, you know, it's the disciples until Paul and then Paul till the rapture. And you get a guy like Martin Richling, he's so confused as a, as a Catholic infiltrator, a, a coadjutor, basically, um, a disinfo agent. It, you know, he doesn't really understand the whole thing. And he's trying to say that there is no preacher of rapture. It's like, well, that's kind of, your system kind of hangs on that there. You know, this, this whole uh, hyper-dispensational thing, it goes from Paul to the rapture. But if there's no, you know, pre-time of Jacob's trouble rapture or catching away, how does that work? That he has the body of Christ going into the time of Jacob's trouble. He's very confused. So what they do is they try to say, see, these first couple verses here, Paul is referring to the Jews, and since there's neither Jew nor Gentile, then he's probably talking to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, well, that's a problem because he goes on in Revelation, or, uh, yeah, Revelation, Romans chapter 11, and talks about the Jews again. And he's referring to the Jews over and over again throughout the book of Romans. So it's nonsense, absolute total nonsense. Uh, no, Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 10 or whatever, the hyper-dispensational heretics, whatever they're trying to say is for the people, only in the people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Uh, there are some things that Paul is explaining that, hey, the Jews are, are rejecting right now, and they're eventually going to be saved. Yeah, that's about stuff in the future, but he's explaining it to, to us as Christians today. That's all that the book of Romans is about. So don't fall for this hyper-dispensational thing where they're coming in and they're actually cutting portions, portions out of the Pauline epistles to try and say it's not for us. Okay, it's, it's kooky nonsense. Don't listen to them.